Today I'm going to make a video that you guys have been asking for me to remake for a very long time. A few years ago I made a video about how I do self peeling using the Petzl shunt. Many of you watched it and liked it but there were a few things that I wasn't happy with about it and so I actually ended up taking it off YouTube um, in order to make again. Because um, I think I felt that if I was going to talk about how I do self peeling I wanted to have uh, more of an in-depth chat about, about safety because like all types of climbing, leading, top roping, soloing is a dangerous thing and there were some aspects of the previous video that I'd like to go through in a bit more detail. One of those is actually the device that I use itself which is the Petzl shunt. Um, now there have been some really serious accidents with this where uh, people have been uh, self peeling on a top rope with this device and they've actually managed to detach the device from the top rope altogether and have a full on ground fall from quite a height and be really seriously injured. And obviously people have been having these accidents for years and years and years. I've been using Petzl shunt for nearly 20 years and was obviously aware of uh, people having accidents with them as they do with all devices. But given that they get shared more widely on social media these days, people have sort of been asking me a few times since, why do I still use this device? So I'm gonna get into that when we get down on the rope and talk about how I mitigate the risks of using this device and why I prefer it over other devices. Some people will still use things like the Petzl Grigri, other people will use other devices like a Mini Traction or uh, a Tazlov 2. I go into some of the differences between them. I haven't used all of them. But one of the one of the main things I want to say in this video is that self beely climbing is dangerous. It's hazardous and you have to mitigate the hazards with careful planning and knowing exactly what you're doing and knowing the strengths and weaknesses of everything about the system, not just the device you use, uh, but the whole of the rope system. And a really critical point I want to make in this video is it's not just about the device, it's about how you use it. But I'll get into devices and this device, the shunt, uh, once we get down on the rope. But for now, I'm gonna set up a top rope. Obviously, rigging the system with a rope is slightly different depending on the size and angle and direction of the climb that you're actually wanting to work on. So there's no set formula. A lot of this is about being inventive and uh, improvising as you go along within certain boundaries, if you like. So I'll just say something about what gear I've actually brought with me. So I've obviously got my harness, I've got my static rope behind me there. That's, uh, I've set it up on a belay just on a tree. But as soon as we go over the edge, I need to reposition the rope uh, both directionally, I need to get it slightly more to the right. Um, and I also need to get it right in the right spot. So I'm going to re belay straight away as I go over the edge. And that's one of the key aspects of doing this for edge protection and also directional uh, control over the, where the rope actually sits. But I should say something about what I've got. So I've got a Grigri for abseiling down. I'm on a single rope. I'm on a 11 millimeter static rope, a very beefy solid rope, uh, mainly because I'm using the shunt. That's absolutely key. Uh, and I'll get into that in a bit more detail later. Uh, I've also got a Jumar with a foot loop, which is about a meter long so that I can use it for moving up the rope if I need to, which I may well do, because I'm going to be working some moves that I want to kind of do over and over or do a bit of cleaning or whatever. I've got a few beefy sport climbing quick draws, which are just easy to grab. And you'll see why um, I like them for quickness of use when I'm rebeeling. I've also got a few extra screw gates, which I'll use for my rebeeling. I've got a Petzl Connect, which is actually just for hanging the camera that you're watching this on, uh, on the wall um, and tightening it up against the tripod. So that's not really relevant to the system itself. Uh, I have got my wire brush for cleaning the root. Put that on my right side. I don't need that yet, I'm left handed. I've got a handful of light quick draws, which I can use for extending runners. And the reason I brought my kind of light tri climbing quick draws is because I'm not gonna be grabbing these. These are for, for leaving behind above me on the rope. And I'm just minimizing weight. A few more screw gates. Good to have plenty of them for making belays. <laughs> Five is probably a lot more than I need though. And then I've got a rack of cams. Normally I would obviously take some wires as well with me tri climbing, but 
I've been on this route before and I just happen to know that I can do all the rigging with cams and that's just kind of quicker and easier. Most of the protection's cams and I need to actually suss out exactly which runners go where. So I'll get these in my harness. The last thing I've got that's important is a rope protector. Um, I think possibly, arguably, the most risky thing about top rope self belaying is edge protection, frayed ropes above you when you're bouncing on them working moves repeatedly. So I would always bring at least one of these and if I know I'm going to be going over a couple of edges I may even bring two or maybe even more. Um, I've only brought one today because it's really one pitch of this two pitch climb that I'm going to focus on. So I'm just going to hang up with my harness ready for the edge. I think we're ready to go, let's go down the rope. I've just abseiled over the lip of the crag onto a small ledge that's just underneath the lip and the climb is right below me here. It's actually slightly towards the camera here, towards my right. Um, so I need the rope really to be about here and not way over here where it is at the moment. Um, so I'm going to do a re -beely. That's the simplest way to direct the rope. Now I could just put in a runner in this crack in front of me here and just clip the rope to it. But then above me, it's still running over all those rock edges at the kind of rough ground at the top of the crag. And I don't want that. So I want it to still be attached to the belay here, but I don't want it to be rubbing as I'm abseiling or, or jugging up at the end of the day. So I'm going to put a runner in there and re belay to it. I'll just show you how I do that. Green camel in there probably. Right in the back. Very good. It so happens that the edge of the carabiner is not kind of over the lip there. So I'm just going to extend it a bit. That just takes it over the edge. That's why these extra quick draws are kind of useful. So now I need to attach the rope to it with a knot. I'm stood on a quite a good ledge here. So I would confidently pull up the slack uh, and take slack here and do it standing on this ledge such that if I were to lose my balance and fall off, I'd fall down about however many, six feet but I wouldn't go all the way. Uh, so I'd be confident enough to do that. But if you're actually hanging and you can't stand with your weight off the rope, that's where these sport climbing quick draws come in. I'd clip a couple of them to my belay loop. I'm going to take all three of them actually. And then I'm going to clip myself direct to the runner, but not to the bit I'm going to make the knot in, because I need to keep that free. And then I can put my weight on the actual runner itself and that allows me to unweight the rope. I'm not going to unclip myself from the rope, I'm just going to unweight it. But before I actually slacken off the rope, I would give that a right good bounce test. I mean, I'm absolutely certain that's a good cam. Um, and if it wasn't, I'd back it up and make it like an actual belay with multiple placements. But I know I don't have to do that. So what I've done there is just clove hitched the rope uh, to that runner and the rope above, and I'll just pull it a bit tighter yet actually, is virtually tight but not quite. There's just a smidgen of slack in it so that if that single piece were to pull out then I'm not going to drop anywhere. I'm going to drop like a few centimetres, hardly anything. Uh, but obviously I would only do this if I knew that this was solid. I'm actually just going to extend it a tad more over that edge so that the rope's not rubbing on anything. There we go, that's better. Right, now I can tighten back up my grigri. Just check that I've got the amount of slack that I'm happy with here. And I can unclip myself. Still away, the quick draws. And I am ready to keep abseiling down. So I've just abseiled down the wall and you can see I've swung a bit to the left and I've grabbed onto a couple of jugs there and then I've just made another re because I need to move the rope a bit to the left. So I've put in a cam in a horizontal brake there as you can see and I could have just clipped that uh, directly into the rope. Oh, I'm bleeding. <laughs> but because it's running over an edge up there, which I've not got the rope protector on. I don't need to bring two. All I can do here is 
I can just do another wee bailey. So I've clove hitched it. The rope above, it's not tight, but it's not far away from it. <clears throat> so it's not going to be rubbing on that edge. So I've, I've used sliding the clove hitch gives you just the right amount of tension such that if I was abseiling or something below and that cam were to come out, I'm not going to drop anywhere. Literally going to be a centimetre or two just on the stretch of the rope. So just as I've abseiled down the sled system a little bit further and looking over the edge, I've realised that I do actually need to be slightly further to the left again. But I don't really need to make another rebeely because that one's already taking me over the edge above, if you like. I just really need a directional to hold the rope a bit to the left. So there's a little crack just in here. I'm just going to place a cam in it there and I'm going to clip one second. I'm just going to clip the rope directly into it. If I swing round, you can see that that runner is just holding the rope to the left. And now I've put this rope protector to protect that. If I was bouncing up and down on that thing, that would destroy my rope very quickly. One of the most dangerous things about doing this. And now I'm directly above where I need to be for working the crux moves of this climb. And that's the plan for a wee minute. All right, so I am hanging on overhanging terrain now. and I'm starting to swing away. The moves that I want to work are down there. You can see the chalk holds. And I'd prefer to be up tight against the rock. But this is the problem with working overhanging routes in general. That's why in general, you would work sport routes on the lead rather than on top rope, because it's just easier to stay in contact with the rock. So I've actually put in a little cam in a flake here, and I'm going to clip my rope above my gree gree into that just to hold the rope in against the wall. But I'm actually going to clip it in short directly into the loop there. And I'm going to clip that straight into my rope like so. Okay, and now I'm hung right against the wall, which is where I want to be. But I'm still happy that my rope is not rubbing over any edges above. I can still see that rope protector and I've got it on a cinch uh, to make sure that it can't move up or down. So we've made it to the foot of the route. Um, the rain's come on, but not to worry. The wall should be overhanging enough that it's not a problem. Um, so now we've got the rope set up. I know that I can bounce it on this rope for hours and the edge above is protected. It's in the right place. It's pulled into the wall with directionals and I'm ready to climb. So <laughs> the next and one of the most important things to consider is the actual self belay device itself. <clears throat> so for self belay climbing, for about 20 years, I've used the Petzl shunt. It's not designed as a self belay device and uh, it's not recommended. I'm not recommending you do it either. And one thing I definitely do strongly emphasize is that all self belaying, um, whether with this device or with others, is pretty hazardous and there are ways to make it go wrong such that you might have an accident. However, I think that if you know the limitations of whatever device you use, I don't see this as being any more dangerous than leading with a partner or actually even top roping with a partner. Because the thing is, other human beings as a belay device are hazardous as well and have their weaknesses. Actually, my worst accident with climbing involved being dropped by my belayer. Accidents happen. So initially, I used to use the Petzl Gree Gree as a self belay device. And it doesn't really work that well. It's not designed for self belaying either. Obviously, it's designed for belaying a leader. So with the Petzl Gree Gree, you know, you just clip it into your harness as you normally would. Have your screw gate done up. I would probably use a mail on rather than a screw gate because that screw gate, if, it, if it's moving around, can get undone. Um, and if you're using the wrong type of carabiner, you can end up with a Gree Gree on the gate and leaving it open and actually opening the, the device. So if you're using the Gree Gree to self belay, then obviously as you're actually climbing up, you have to take a hand off every so often and pull the rope up, which is fine if you're climbing on not so difficult terrain. But I would almost always be using this on difficult terrain. That's precisely why I, I need it is because I need to actually practice hard moves uh, before I lead. And I don't have access to have 
um, I'd be there constantly. I don't live in a place where there's lots of climbers. Um, so in order to get enough practice time on projects, that's actually why I'm doing it in the first place. So the obvious weakness with the Petzl Grigri, although it's used by thousands of people all over the world all the time, is that you're only ever pushing that part of, of the locking mechanism down for it not to lock. Um, it's less likely to happen if you're using a big, thick, beefy static. Again, this is an 11 millimeter static rope that I'm using. But then if you climb and you don't actually take it in for too long, you don't really want to be taking a big fall into a static rope anyway. But anyway, a thick rope is gonna help. But there are a number of ways where this can go badly wrong. Um, one is that the lever, which is very easy to move, can get caught. Either it can get pulled sometimes by the dead rope like that. And then if the dead rope somehow hooks, hooks over it or that part gets caught in your clothing or something like that, and then you fall, the device won't lock. Or if you fall off and push the device like that in panic, it won't lock. And it doesn't take long to drop uh, 20, 30 feet, uh, you know, high enough to actually hurt yourself um, before you actually realize what's going on and take your hand off. Often, uh, especially for climbers who are not super experienced and a little bit nervous, that instinct is to panic and keep panicking and not to really think, I need to take my hand off it. That is a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but easy to get wrong when you get a fright and you've actually just fallen off. That also obviously happens when you're beeling another climber. Um, I used to coach a climber who had very seriously injured himself when um, his beeler at the climbing wall had panicked, he fell off and the beeler got pulled forward and just out of instinct did that and the device didn't lock and he dropped to the floor and I hurt himself very badly. I've also seen um, someone forget to clip into both leaves of the actual Grigri itself. So they, out of quickness, they clipped in like that, but had only clipped in to one leaf of the Grigri. Um, and it just, it just sits there quite the thing. They climbed up the route, got to the top, sat back on the Grigri. It still works fine, it still will even hold you, but will open like that. And you can see that there's nothing holding that rope in. And thankfully, as they sat on the rope and the Grigri flipped up, they noticed and grabbed back onto the belay. So there are ways to get yourself killed with a Grigri as well. Then there's the Tazlov 2. I've not brought that with me today, but for a wee second, I might talk about the Tazlov 2 and why I don't use it. This device is the Tazlov 3, and a lot of people really like it for top rope soloing. I still favor the shunt over this device for four or five reasons, which I'll just tell you about now. The first of them is kind of insignificant. It's just that the device is a bit heavy and I do like my climbing gear to be light, especially for climbing on hard routes. But that's a, that's a minor thing, it's not really important. The more important reason, I, I should also just first say that the, the major advantage of this device is that when you solo and you climb up the rope and then you weight the device, it has a handle so that you can abseil back down. So you never need to change the device for a Grigri. So that does have a safe, safety aspect to it as a positive because you're not having to change devices. So that's a, an opportunity to make errors. Um, however, there's a couple of things that I, I'm not so keen on with this device, um, specifically related to how it actually engages. So if I just open it, open the device up, see it's got two leaves. And if I just bring it over. So there's two uh, metal uh, cinches that when the rope is running up the way, it runs through them. And when the device is weighted, it rotates to put that turn in the rope. And that's what actually makes it lock. There's also a third piece, which is this plastic cleat here, which is just gently spring loaded. So that just puts a bit of pressure on the rope. That just creates a little bit of friction as the rope slides up. So there is a little bit of friction there, even with the rope sliding up, that will pull on you as you climb, but it's not that much. But that is also important in encouraging the device to rotate as you weight it and then, and then lock. So one thing is that that plastic cleat could wear down. But the other thing is that if I just do that, can you see that it, it 
it catches on the metal piece below and it remains open. So there's not that friction in it sliding up and down the rope. And I, I'm not really too sure if that will affect its ability to actually catch you in a fall. But the base of it just protrudes slightly out the, the back of the device there because that's underneath my screw gate and I can't see it. I can't easily check it. With the, the little plastic cleat uh, engaged there, I run the device up the rope and then it'll stay there. And if I weight the carabiner as in a fall, it's essential that the device rotates round in order to actually engage and catch the fall. So if I just in, if I just catch that plastic cleat on the bit before, you can see that the device just drops freely down the rope. That might be different if you're actually catching a fall like that. It will still lock. However, it doesn't take much of a force, like if you were falling kind of forwards onto the rope, so that even if I weight the carabiner, but I just push it down, it still falls very freely down the rope without engaging. It has to be a slightly outward pull on, on the rope uh, for it to actually engage. So I just feel that that's just not, like you feel it go immediately as soon as that thing releases, then it catches much better. I just feel like that's just a little bit easy to not catch you. You really have to have that outward pull. The other aspect to it is that both leads are not a closed eye for the carabiner to connect. Um, and that just allows you to, um, for rope access purposes, um, it allows you to always leave the device um, clipped to your Beely loop and you can't drop it. So when it's actually weighted like that, if you press that lever and try, if you, I just, I'd probably be easier to, if I was hanging in my harness doing this, but if you actually try to release the leaf and rotate it out while it's weighted, it won't do it. It has to be in that orientation. But that spring-loaded button is very, very easy to push in. And I just kind of wonder if, if it's between your legs um, and let's say you had a cam or something that rotated into the, the inside of your leg and just pressed on that that it could just release it. I mean, I don't think it would, but it is quite easy to, to, to release. And um, I don't know, I just kind of would rather that was a closed loop, which is actually what the old version of this device had. The other aspect to it is that um, because it needs to rotate in order to engage, if the device is on your Beely loop and it's down uh, between your legs, if you actually close your legs together, it won't, won't engage and you'll drop. That's slightly analogous to the shunt, which is if you grab it with your hands and uh, don't allow it to engage, then it'll, you'll just drop. But with the possibility of both legs or one leg holding the device in that orientation and allowing it to go down, um, I'm not so comfortable with. Now you can get around that by using a chest harness and holding the device right up here. Um, but for working hard routes, that becomes a little bit more impractical if you're wanting to do Kind of the more athletic moves that you would do on hard routes, which is why I'm using the device in the first place. So many people love this device and really trust it. Um, I just don't favor it myself. And overall, I favor the Petzl Shunt, although both have their pros and cons with respect to safety and usability. There's also the Mini Traction. I've never used that for self wheeling, partly because I've just got into the habit of using the Shunt and getting to know this device very well. So I can't make any comment about that. My preferred device is the Petzl Shunt. It's very simple. It's not designed for self beeling so this is off-label. I'm just showing you what I do. I'm not recommending you do it. It is dangerous. I always connect it to the rope with a mail on, a big beefy mail on, rather than a screw gate because it's very easy for a screw gate to get undone. And it's also easy for the shunt to turn with the screw gate sideways like that and if the shunt is sitting on the gate it can lever the gate open if you fall and unclip you so i always use the mail on and i always use an 11 mil an 11 millimeter rope because it's less likely to actually disconnect itself from the rope the shunt can disconnect itself if it's upside down so obviously the way the mechanism of the shunt works as you climb up the rope it pulls the lever arm up the way. It's, it just gently releases the spring. This is spring-loaded here. 
and it allows it to slide up the rope without a bother. But if you then weight the lever arm, because that's what's connected to your harness, then it locks it. And to actually detach the shunt from the rope, you push that lever arm up and you just keep pushing it all the way through such that this gap at the bottom opens and you can take the shunt out. However, there is a way for this to happen when you're actually connected to it, which is to get the shunt upside down. It's not particularly easy to do, but if you flip the shunt that way, can you see that the rope actually jams in there? Um, and if you then fall off and pull, you're now pu pulling the lever arm up to open the shunt as you fall off. And that opens that just enough that if you're using a skinnier rope or actually with enough force, even an 11 mil rope, it can detach the shunt completely. And there have been accidents with this over the years. So the absolute key thing is to not get the shunt upside down ever. And that does take a little bit of vigilance. So there's a few ways where this can go wrong. I'm going to show you one, which happened to a friend of mine, using the shunt with a screw gate. I don't actually know if I can even reproduce it. You got the screw gate to flip over the top of the shunt. I don't know what, it must be a different shape from this one. So that it held the lever arm jammed open and fell and dropped to a stopper knot. <coughs> there's also another way which is that if you fall off, if you, again, if you instinctively grab the shunt, you're opening the lever. So if you grab it, it just won't lock and you'll just drop um, to your stop or not or to the ground. So you obviously, when you fall off, you have to instinctively let go of the shunt, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. Some people also instinctively grab the rope. I sometimes do that as well. Um, if it's a gentle fall and I actually know that I'm strong enough to grab an 11 mil rope and hold on, but I also still push like that. And what that does is it, it, it allows the shunt to lock. So it just actually helps, helps me to also see it as I fall off and make it lock. I want the rope to go away from me. I'd, what I don't want to do is to get the head of the shunt caught in my clothing or in anything else. So I keep other paraphernalia on my harness away. I don't like having anything else on my belay loop to complicate things. So I think the real risk with the shunt, and I'm gonna move it back to the mail on, since I would never be using it with a screw gate. The good thing about this is it takes ages to do up. You have to do it all the way, but then you know you've not forgotten to do it. <laughs> Cause you've got this process that if you've not gone through the laborious thing of tightening it up, you know you've not done it. So that never happens. So as you're climbing up, a risk is that the shunt gets caught in, it'd have to be, the real risk would actually be in my right leg because the shunt's on the left rope. So if I rock over, if I put my leg up like that and rock over, can you see that the head of the shunt can get caught there um, and flip upside down? Now it wouldn't normally stay upside down because you're waiting tail end. It should normally sit back like that. But if you've either not got enough weight on the dead end of the rope, and we'll talk about weight in a second, or the rope itself is too thin, like using, I don't know, like a 10 mil or even less than 10 mil sport rope, which is pretty light, then it can be just not heavy enough to force the shunt to keep in the same direction. Then it can easily flip. So it shouldn't really stay flipped upside down, but you'd really have to stay vigilant that you're not getting the shunt flipped. It's not catching on anything. It could catch on the rock. It could catch on your leg. But what you want to avoid, make sure you avoid, is you, you don't ever end up in that position. Again, like, it's quite hard to actually get it to stay there. It should flip back round. But if it happens dynamically enough as you come off, or if you were to grab it, like in that position and, and then therefore keep it held upside down, then you'd be in trouble. <laughs> so the basic rule is at, at all times, it has to stay upright. I'm not relying on a shunt ever. I'm relying on my own vigilance to make sure that it stays orientated like this. However, the risk of you still making a mistake um, and causing the shunt not to lock uh, is never zero. And that's something that I accept. So before I start climbing, I need to weight the rope 
and I'm going to put quite a lot of weight on it to make sure. So I'm going to tie an overhand knot in it and then all the spare rack that I don't need. The best part of half my rack on there already and I'm going to put my shoes on there as well. Um, and then if that's not quite enough, I might uh, coil up the rope and use the tail end of the rope as well to weight it. And what that does is it just means the shunt. See, that's not enough weight yet. I need more. So you should choose what device you're happy with. All of them that I know of have their hazards. Some would prefer them more than others. My preferred one is still the shunt, in part because I know it very well um, and it's very simple. So the ways that you can get it wrong are pretty simple, um, mainly getting upside down or grabbing it. And I practiced over a long time, first of all, in the safety of the ground, then with uh, a backup and then uh, on its own. So I don't use any other backup device. And so I recognize that if anything goes wrong with this system, then I'm going to fall to the ground. Um, so that's a, a hazard that I'm happy to take on. And I'm happy to mitigate that with my familiarity with the system and a very strict discipline to make sure that the shunt stays in the correct orientation and I don't make compromises elsewhere with things like the rope or the weighting of the rope or any, anything else. This first section of the route goes diagonally away from me and so what I've done is I've put in a couple of cams here at the base. This could also be further up the route, it doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to clip the rope to them such that the rope is going diagonally. There's a couple of ways you can do this. You can either clove hitch it direct to the rope which keeps it tight that has its own difficulties because uh, because the rope is then taut it makes it much more difficult to transfer onto a grigri to abseil back down you would actually have to down climb with the shunt which i'll show you how i do in a moment um, another way is just to clip it as a runner but then make a stopper knot i don't know if you can see that but uh, i put in an overhand just below the runners so that I'll swing away but not that much so that's gonna those runners are gonna keep my rope pulled in to the right here so that I can't swing too far to the left now I'm just gonna get my rope shoes on and let's get some climbing done so these moves at the start are actually quite difficult and um, I could probably just climb through them uh, if I really wanted to but that's actually not my goal here my goal is to work them so that they're easy I need to get them dialed the rocks not particularly clean and I need to suss out the sequence there's not a lot of tension in the rope to keep it the holes are over here I want to be here um, but I can get over there by just rocking over onto my dead rope and just almost kind of sitting on it and then I can inspect the holds no, that's not very good <laughs> and see what I want to do and just give it a clean I don't really let a minute go past without just having a visual check on the shunt is that mail on still done up? is everything cool with my harness? yep that's all fine and I'm just checking I can still see that rope protector up there just a double check on the system because at this point, this is where you get absorbed in the climbing. And so I just it's just a habit you get into of just checking, is the system still fine before you disappear back into concentration again? I'm actually gonna come a bit lower now, but as you can see, my dead rope is going horizontally. So I'm actually gonna use my jug as a handle. I'm gonna pinch the shunt, drop it down a bit, and just slide it to the right. And I'm actually going to put my leg over the rope to help me get it back down. Okay. Done. If the rope was going straight down, then I couldn't just release the shunt to drop down and try the move again. I'd have to put my jug on uh, and hang off that in order to slide the shunt down. But sometimes actually climbing on overhanging terrain is easier. The rope is held in horizontally to my piece of gear. 
because it's going sideways, but it would also be the same if I was on a very steep overhang. So I can actually put a leg on there, lean back a bit, so I'm hanging off the, the top rope part, and then pinch the shunt and just drop down like that. And it makes it really straightforward to go back down and try a section again. Okay, so now I've finished working those first few moves. I'm going to move the camera and myself a bit higher up to the crux and I'll talk a bit more about using the shunt. And I'm at the crux of this first pitch of the route. When I've come up here, I've double checked that my I can still see my rope protector and everything is cool with the rope above me. It's not running over any edges, which in my opinion is the main danger with doing this type of climbing. Um, and I've actually, rather than climbed up, because I had the camera with me, I've just jugged up the rope. So I've just um, stood in my foot loop like that, pushed the jumar up, I've taken the shunt ready to pinch it like that, if you can see that. And then as I stand up in the foot loop, I pinch open the shunt and just slide it up. Pinch open the shunt, slide it up. That's how I've jugged up. And to go back down, I just pull the trigger on my jumar, drop it down a bit, get my weight in the foot loop, pinch the shunt, drop back down. So that's how I move up and down the rope easily. If I want to switch to the Grigley to abseil back to the floor. I'll just show you how I do that. So I would get my quick draws and place two of them on the top side of my Beely loop there. Clip them into the base of my Juma and just slide that up a bit. And then I'd slacken off the shunt so that I drop down onto my weight onto there. And then all I would do as I would attach my Gree Gree, obviously before I take the shunt off. That's pretty crucial, because that's still what's keeping me safe here. So I'd get the screw gate ready on my gear loop, on my Beely loop, sorry. I'd attach the Gree Gree. So, clip that in, screwed up the screw gate. So now I'm good on the Gree Gree. And then I would take off the shunt and clip myself from the Jumar and I would have sailed down to where I want to go. But because I, I've set up my system to just move up and down this sort of 10, 15 foot section, I'm not going to bother doing that. I can very quickly move up and down just using the shunt. That's just if you want to finish, take a break or, or get back to the ground for whatever reason. <laughs> but I'm actually not going to go to the ground again today. I'm going to work this section and then I'm going to go up. So I'm back on the shunt. Before I do anything else, I'm just going to have another double check that I'm happy with everything in my system. And then I'm going to just slide that up a bit. Come off the uh, Jumar, get these quick draws out of the way because I don't want anything interrupting my system here. Can you see that below me, I've left a runner clipped into the rope and all that's doing is just hold it, just pulling me in slightly. If I, if I take my feet off, you can see that it holds me in. If that runner wasn't there, I would just drift away from the wall slightly. That just allows me to inspect this bit of rock. Here's the crux move on this project and try it repeatedly. Um, but obviously when I'm finished trying it and I'm going to move up the way, then I'll take these runners out and I'll just continue to climb. Um, the other thing I'm going to do before I start climbing is put in a stopper knot in here. Which just gives a layer of protection in case there was anything that interrupted the shunt and if you fell onto it and it didn't lock and you dropped, you would drop, well, you drop to that runner um, or the stop or not. Now, <clears throat> it's possible that the shunt would still actually break because it's not designed to take a dynamic fall. I mean, I don't know if that would happen or not. <laughs> if the shunt hasn't locked and you're dropping, that's disaster stations. That's something you just don't want to ever be possible. The name of the game here is not to ever let that happen in the first place by keeping your system nice and simple and clean. <clears throat> and that's actually one of the reasons why I don't use a backup because there's that gives the downside of you relying on one device, one thing. I mean, I'm relying on one rope anyway. Uh, so even if I have a backup, I'm still on one rope. Uh, you could also have a second rope. I have done that once or twice when there's lots of edges that I can't protect but it gets to be uh, a bit of a faff. Most of the time, uh, the trade-off of safety that I like is to have one rope, one device that I know very well, um, and there's no complication. 
So it takes me a nanosecond to look at that shunt and see that everything is fine with it. Um, when I, and I do that all the time, constantly, when I'm actually climbing. So every time I do a move and I look at my feet, I look at the shunt as well. I do it so often that I don't even realise I'm doing it. Um, but if I ever look down and I see that shunt just caught in my trouser or my harness or something, and it's just pulling it slightly to one side, then I discontinue the move or I correct the shunt before I keep moving up. As we described earlier, we never ever want to get to a situation where the shunt can go upside down because then you would actually just be soloing. Okay, so let's see if we can do these moves. And just to reiterate, um, aside from vigilance, two things that are preventing that shunt from being able to go upside down as I'm climbing are one, the 11 mil beefy heavy rope, and two, the amount of weight on the shunt below me. So I've got quite a few kilos on there. I've got my boots, uh, more than half a rack, and I've got the tail end of the rope coiled up. I would definitely not use a thinner rope, like a thin sport rope, you know, or even a medium sport rope. Wow. That's savage, that crimp. Oh no, man, no, no, no. Oh, nearly. Okay, so <laughs> my camera ran out of battery. This is actually did the move. I don't know if it got it or not, but I did manage to do that crux move. And then I've moved up, I've stripped out all of my rebailies on the ledges down below me there. Um, and I've come up to try the crux moves of the second pitch. A wee trick you can also do is just to jam your feet wrapped kind of around the rope below you to get friction. So if you just can't be bothered getting the jug off your harness for just two seconds to go up like half a foot then it's just a quick way of doing it always work the top out <laughs> I just was trying to move to the hold here and uh, I pulled it off in my hand as I was reaching for the top of the crag if I'd done that on the lead I would have taken an absolute monster so yeah always get the top out wired or the easy bit or whatever saves your life few times. That's better. Before we move on, I just want to show you how I set up the rope on a few other routes with different logistical challenges that people often ask me about. As with the rest of this video and rope soloing in general, I'm not recommending you do it the same way as me. The hazards involved would not be acceptable for some and they may not have the necessary skills to mitigate them. The first example illustrates this well. This is my route Nemesine on Ben Nevis, which I made an episode about last year. Here I'm trying to smoothly link the whole climb without resting in preparation for leading it. A couple of people commented that my last stopper knot in the rope below me is a long way down and they felt this is risky. To link the pitch in one, I'm not able to take a hand off for long enough to tie an overhand knot in the rope and so I do it without. It's certainly a hazard that if I fell here and the shunt did not lock, falling all the way down to that distant stopper knot would not be good. <laughs> However, the presence of the knot isn't the only way to mitigate this. I simply don't climb the same way as I would if the stopper knot were right below me. I'm even more vigilant than usual that the shunt remains unobstructed and is in the correct orientation and would tend to climb the moves in a conservative manner with a margin of control similar to how I would if I were leading. And this is the more important point, I'm preparing to lead the climb which has almost non-existent protection with a significant chance of dying if you fail on lead. In this case, the very modest increased hazard in linking the climbing one on the shunt without tying backup knots is massively outweighed by the need to be certain that I can climb it comfortably on the lead with a margin. This illustrates perfectly the trade-offs in risk management in trad climbing and mountaineering. Working with a small hazard in one part of the process with mitigation in place allows you to reduce your exposure to a much bigger hazard elsewhere in the process. Your judgement on that might be different from mine, and I hope that your judgement would be not to climb E9 at all. It's not something I'd recommend for all but the most committed of climbers. This climb is called Keystone, another climb that I made an episode about last year. Here I've clove hitched the rope to runners at the back of the roof and also at the lip with a rope protector on the lip as well, and the rope clipped to some but not all the runners in between. 
With a bit of trial and error, I can find the right amount of tension in the rope so that I can climb the moose freely without the rope pulling me, but also not drop oh. down too far if I sit on the rope. Oh. Coming back across the roof to try it again is pretty simple. To strip it all out at the end of the session, I just switch back to the grigri and aid across the runners in the roof to get out. If there weren't any runners in the roof, I could lower myself out from a runner at the back of the roof, pull the rope through and then retrieve the runner from below. All a bit more advanced and again I'm just showing you what I do, not recommending it. Finally, this was working an overhanging 9A sport route called Hunger, it's about 70 degrees overhanging. I needed lots of days on it and it's not easy to find partners for this crag and so I went to some extra lengths to refine my rigging. Here I've clo fetched the rope below me to a bolt with a carefully adjusted amount of slack to strike a balance between falling too far out from the holds to be able to pull back on, but not too tight that the rope pulls you and makes the climbing impossible. This also took a bit of trial and error. As I got closer to linking the whole thing, I even set up a transfer from one shunt to another to get around the risk of swinging outwards and hitting a boulder that's just out of shot if I had been on a single line which was not keyed in below me. It's the only time I've ever used the shunt without the malleon to connect, so instead used a black diamond gridlock screw gate. This took a fair bit of thought and faff to get right and it's not something I would do routinely. I just wanted to show you how you can get around logistical challenges with rigging and still make the climbing at your limit feasible. Again though, there are plenty of ways to get this wrong and I think lots of climbers would rightly consider it not suitable for them. So last job of the day, it's getting kind of dark. I've just come back to my last rebeelie. So I'm doing this one handed so sorry if this is a bit shaky. I'm going to connect a quick draw to myself uh, and now I've got my weight off the rope uh, so I can undo this pull fitch and carry on. So I'll quickly undo the pull fitch with two hands. Okay so with that done that's pull fitch out. My rope's going back to my tree belay just over the lip of the crag there and all I need to do now that my weight's back on the shunt is strip out that cam and top out. So it's getting pretty dark now, I'm just heading home for a cup of tea. Again I want to reiterate that I don't recommend you do this any more than I recommend you do leading or free soloing or anything like that. You've got to know that your system, uh, that you're happy with both the limitations of it and the risks of it. You can try and mitigate those risks to a certain extent, uh, but not completely. Um, there are other people who, do, who use different setups, specifically different devices from the shunt here. Um, but I still favour the shunt, uh, in part because that's what I'm used to. But I do like it. Whatever system you use, whatever device you use, make sure to uh, practice it carefully, make sure to check everything all the time, and, and know where it's likely to go wrong, and really protect against that. So be safe and enjoy your top rope soloing. <laughs>